Welcome to the Call Like I See It podcast. I'm James Keyes, and in this episode of Call Like I See It, we're going to continue our Streaming Between the Lines series and discuss the trials of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the documentary directed by David Grubbin, which originally aired on PBS back in 2009. We also both saw the 2023 blockbuster entitled blockbuster film entitled Oppenheimer. So we'll draw from that as well in this discussion. Joining me today is a man who, when it comes to first person shooters, is also a destroyer of worlds. Tunde Ogon Lana. Tunde, you ready to unload some insight here for us today? Yeah, man. I, I was never referred to as the Death Star before, but yeah, <laughs> I'm the destroyer of worlds, so be it. There you go. There maybe, you go. maybe Thanos. That could be right. another one. Yeah, yeah. Or Oppenheimer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, we're recording this on January 9th, 2024. And looking at both the, the documentary and the film, we get a look into the life of Robert Oppenheimer, J. Robin Oppenheimer, uh, which was highlighted, you know, the broad and broad strokes by his leading of the team, which developed the first atomic bomb in the Manhattan Project um, in the 1940s. And, you know, which is something that made him a celebrated, you know, American. And then also his subsequent fall from grace uh, due to alleged ties with left wing groups or communism uh, during what, can, you know, is often called the, the second Red Scare period in America. And, you know, both the documentary and the film went about telling these stories in, in slightly different ways, you know, just and that's understandable, you know, with the different formats, you know, one being a documentary, one being a blockbuster film. But in both, and the film, you know, being by Christopher Nolan, you know, the, the one, you know, the, the big one, you know, this, this past summer. But in both, you know, what really comes through are the super high triumphs, you know, that, that were a part of the man's life. And also the, the disappointments or the things that where things didn't happen the way he wanted to and how difficult for him or troubling those were. Uh, so, you know, just to get us started, Tunde, you know, what stood out to you first about Oppenheimer the man, you know, Oppenheimer himself and, you know, like who he was? Yeah, was, I thought that this this guy's arc and his story, both in the documentary and the film, uh, like you said, Christopher Nolan's film, um, it's it's very interesting to learn. Uh, I think in a lot of these biographies, we learn about the human side of someone, yeah. and that's kind of what I walked away from with both the film and the documentary, which obviously it's about the same person's life, so they they married each other pretty well. <laughs> um, just that this guy Shocker. is it was just a. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's just that, um, you know, this was a very human story. That to me was the biggest thing that stuck out. Um, obviously, um, I knew who he was in terms of I'd heard his name. Obviously, I know what an atomic bomb is, you know, all that kind of stuff. So when I when I went to see the film last year, um, you know, I'm going in knowing that stuff about his his kind of overall situation and his impact on our history with with his influence in the making of, of the atomic weapon. However, I was ignorant to his life story. And I think that's to me what was very interesting, his whole arc from his childhood, his time at university, and then, um, and then through the rest of his life, you know, like you mentioned, the whole thing with the Red Scare and all that. So I found it to be a very human story where he had a lot yeah. of complexities that I know we'll get into. No, I mean, and I, I would say with that is, you know, like the interesting thing about that, like they, they made it a point, you know, to, to show or in, in both formats that or to discuss that he wasn't amazing and everything, you know, like when they talked about his time in the lab, you know, and, 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 and when, during his educational time, he, he, he was a theoretical, he's known as a theoretical physicist, but when he spent time in the lab, he was, he struggled with that, you know? And so, but this brilliant man, you know, like a lot of times will then project someone with so much intelligence as being all, oh, well, they must've just, you know, glided through with whatever. But a lot of times you can see how things built resiliency, built character and so forth. Another thing I thought that was very interesting about him as a man is that in many respects, they, they painted him as a person who kind of discovered the world as he as he as he grew up. He discovered the world. And so his ties, quote unquote, to, to communism or, you know, to, to, to leftist ties a lot of times seem to evolve out of, you know, human connections he had made, you know, whether it would be his brother was a member of the, the Communist Party. And so he he wasn't a member of the Communist Party, but he had close personal f either friends or whatever that were. And so he while he was able, it, it, it appears, you know, to, to be able to compartmentalize that and say, OK, well, yeah, this is something that's around me and so forth, close people. But 
you know, it, it, as it, as you get into and, and just kind of seeing the story, once you get to a certain part of American history, that wasn't cool anymore. Like even having, even knowing people, you know, that, that had certain political leanings, even if they had those leanings 15, 20 years in the past, it was like, oh, you know, like we're, we're all worked in a tizzy, but it, it the, the way that he became exposed to these things or that he kind of, it, it was, it was something of compassion even, you know, it was like, okay, well, you know, I care about people, so to speak. And I thought that was really interesting, you know, because again, we, we see the guy as you, 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 the guy who's, you know, among the most famous people in the history of the world for being the develop, developing of, you know, the atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb. You wouldn't think of that person and think compassion. <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's like, you know, this is the person that, you know, created the, the, the web first weapon of mass destruction like that. And so, you know, just to see, those, again, like those more human sides of it. And I think this is illustrated later on through his evolution in terms of once the once the nuclear weapons were created, how he wanted to treat them, which I'm sure we'll get into uh, in this discussion. But I think that part of him came through in which we'll talk about with the nuclear weapons, but also in other parts of his life. So, yeah. you know, like, well, would go ahead. No, I mean that I agree. That's to me that was the complex part. The, yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. That, Which, that, and and this is the part to me, and I'll, I'll, we'll get to this later on the discussion. But it's a pattern we've seen even in, in modern times, meaning our lifetime in recent, you know, last couple of decades. And I think this is probably something that's happened in all societies at all times, which is there's different factions of, and, and different kind of subcultures within a larger group, and people have different ideas. And to your point, people associate in different ways. And, and, and to finish this part about his, the, the human part of him, he, he was, um, what I found interesting is he was so focused on his scientific work pretty much till his probably early to mid thirties. So his whole twenties into his early thirties that, um, I mean, the documentary cited this, that, that, that he didn't know about the Wall Street crash of 1929 until six months later when he was just taking a walk with one of his friends and they happened to talk about it. that That's how driven and focused he was on his science. So to your point, as I just expanding on it a bit, when he started seeing some of his students when he was teaching at Berkeley suffering during the Great Depression, just from, you know, they couldn't eat, they, they were having a tough time making ends meet. To your point, that's where he began, began to have compassion and started looking at what we would consider today more left-leaning ideas of the culture, like helping the labor movement and things like that. And that's where he was, he, he got into being around people who, you know, were members of the communist party. But it was always pragmatic. And that was kind of the thing. Correct. It wasn't, he, he didn't seem to be an ideological person, which allowed yeah, him exactly. to be kind of open to different ideas and evaluate them for himself. And the kind of independent thinker is a theme that keeps coming back up. And I mean, it just what that really does is a lot of times we like to be very reductive in our evaluation of people and just make them two dimensional. And this person was blank. This person was blank. And then that's it. And so, but the story of Oppenheimer really, if you, if you take it for what it is, it forces you to go beyond that because it wasn't just, Oh, it's just in this box, like the developer of nuclear, you know, or the, the, of, of the first atomic bomb, which is the weapon of mass destruction to uh, the best, the biggest and the baddest, you know, at, at its time of, you know, the, the, the start of that race, you know, also was this person who, you know, cared about, you know, economic uh, well-being and stuff and, you know, those kind of things. So it's just, you know, it's, it's difficult to just put that all in one box. Um, so the other thing, though, I mean, and this is we, we just got to get straight to it. You know, the, a big part of the story is the technological achievement, you know, that was the development of the, the first atomic bomb and how, you know, it fed a split between those who wanted to keep building more powerful weapons, you know, like they'd say, Hey, like we, we started here and we have to maintain this dominance, uh, whether it be as a, as a deterrence or, or any other justification. Uh, and those who wanted to go in the direction of more so saying immediately saying, Oh my gosh, we have now the power to destroy the world. We should, we shouldn't be looking at war anymore at all. Like we need to get with people and try to figure out ways to control this. Um, how, what do you think about that in terms of that that immediate split that happened? It seemingly after that, like you know, and I'll, I'll just to, to illustrate, you know, it talks about it in the film and the documentary. Like once they completed the bomb, or as they were almost finished with the bomb, Germany surrendered, and there were scientists at that point said, "All right, we need to stop building this. You know, there's no yeah. there's no need to build this anymore." And so as the as they're getting closer and closer to the bomb being completed, and then at once they run the first test, there are people that are immediately saying, "Hey." What we've done here, 
we need to put the brakes on it, you know? So, you know, just kind of, you know, tell me what you think about how this unfolds and, you know, Oppenheimer's role in it. Yeah, it's, it's you know, again, it's all curious because the, the, this guy was so driven on creating um, the atomic bomb. And I think to your point, you said it earlier that he wasn't ideological. Um, and I think that's an important point. He didn't appear to be ide- ideological in his and any over um, associ- in any like crazy yeah. like very 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 like well, that's he, always sticks at, to it. Yeah, like like with his associations with people who are members of the Communist Party, he seemed to just genuinely think that you know workers needed more rights and all that. He he didn't seem to um, get into the whole thing like the you know wanted to be uh, allies with the Soviets and all. He wasn't into some greater cause about it. Yeah. Um, he just kind of aligned himself with some of their views, and it seems like yeah, the same like thing there's here. refugees. Let's give some money to some refugees, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, and you know, we'll get into that during the, the the part about the kind of red scare. But, but then there's also I see it the same way with his scientific work. He was really genuinely passionate about quantum physics and about solving problems, and I think just being a regular, um, you know, curious person that found uh, in the way he developed his mind science and, and equation solving was what he enjoyed tackling. I just, he, he, he clearly loved what he did, but I don't think, but that's what I mean. He was passionate about that. Part of that was creating, you know, nuclear fission or not creating, but, but, but um, continuing the work on nuclear fission and then creating the atom bomb. So again, he wasn't an ideologue like mass murderer that said, Oh, I'm, I'm going to build something so I can just kill hundreds of thousands of people at once. That's not where or, it started. But or he wasn't an ideologue pacifist either, saying, oh, well, yeah. you know, like, it, like he, he seemed to kind of be the the ultimate pragmatist at, at any point, you know, yeah. which would make enemies, though, <laughs> because a lot of people are ideological, you know. So if you're yeah. dumping no, it's, from it's, camp um, to camp because you're pragmatic, yeah, it could be a problem. Yeah. And it's it's it's, you know, it's he's a much milder version, let's put it this way, than I guess his counterpart at the time would have been a gentleman named uh, Werner von Braun in Germany, the developer of the V2 rockets. Who the same thing. I mean, he was a member of the Nazi party and all that stuff. I mean, was he really, you know, a crazy Nazi and all that? Or was he just a guy that loved to build rockets and happened to be, you know, German and, and, and decide, like you're saying, let me be pragmatic and keep building what I love to do. And, you know, they drop them all over London and all that. You know, that's how they're going to use them. I don't know what's in people's head. Right. But I think that Oppenheimer is a great example of that as someone who was brilliant and inventing something. And then it was taken and used in a certain way. And then once he saw how it was being used and the proposals going forward after the atomic bombs were dropped, you know, the the fact that we went into the Cold War with the Soviets and we started making all these additional nuclear weapons, he then had an ethical issue with it. Right. And he said, you know, I don't think this is (laughs) this may not have been the right move. So. So, again, that shows the complexity of him as a person, which because, yeah, because that appears inconsistent. You know, like that, uh, just from the, the surface, it's like, well, hold on. Yeah. You were yeah, you the, 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 <laughs> yeah, you were the head of the Manhattan Project, which, you know, was the project that, that created the first atomic weapon. And so now, you know, like he, he was opposed to developing the first thermonuclear weapon, the hydrogen bomb, which came a couple of years after. Um, and he was opposed to that. And, and, and then he's opposed to a lot of these plans that were, you know, that were being made as far as, OK, well, here's our nuclear deterrent strategy. If, if Russia fires, we're going to do this. Or if this happens, we're going to do this. And it's like, well, but you you were played a major role in starting us down this path, you know. And so, like, why couldn't you foresee that this is where it was going to go once you started down the path anyway? And it in my in, in my view, there were a couple things, a couple of like emotions or, you know, like kind of human aspects that I saw in this one was guilt. You know, just I think that he felt and, and this comes through and i mean I, I think this was intentionally that it came through in the films and you know to the extent this was the accurate portrayal i don't know or whether it's revisionist but it looked like he felt a lot of guilt in terms of his role in this and you know again the the, the, the quote the famous quote i've become death destroyer worlds you know which is quoted from you know a, a hindu text that he you know then made famous i mean that doesn't sound like that, that he wasn't saying that in a way to brag you know, there, there's a gravity to that. Like, oh, my gosh, you know, what have I done, so to speak? Um, but he was also a proud man. And so, like, you, you have to, again, this is that thing where you can't make it a two-dimensional kind of thing. Like, you have to just look at it as, as, as three-dimensional. Like, he viewed it as important. Now, I think a lot of times with a lot of the scientists, it was easier to work on the Manhattan Project and to to to, to be behind the development of this nuclear, nu- nuclear weapon 
when it was Germany was the big bad, you know, when it was Nazis and, and, and so forth. And we're fighting against fascism and, you know, it's in what they're doing in terms of, you know, just murdering people everywhere and trying to take over the world, you know, statedly. And I think it, it, the first t- sign of those cracks where it was like, whoa, 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 why, what, why do we need to do this anymore is once Germany was, was, was once Germany surrendered. And so I think when you take away that big bad, but there were strategic reasons why they, why they wanted to drop it on Japan as well. Some of that being even to demonstrate to the world the power of this thing and in the hopes that, hey, well, once people see how powerful this is, maybe people will stop going, going, you know, going to war, basically. But the division that ended up becoming or that, that come, came out of this, I think, and this is the I, I kind of touched on this before, but I just want to make it clear is is what was one of ide- ideology. It was one of, OK, we need to to do have peace through strength, so to speak, and be be we got to be the biggest guy on the block so that we can make sure there's peace. And then there was other people saying, hey, that's not the way to do it. If we keep building, everybody else is going to keep building. We'll just stockpile the weapons. And so I think we saw the beginnings of that within Oppenheimer's mind. You know, like just how he evolved over the over like a five year period from, you know, the work on the Manhattan Project to his opposition to the development of the thermonuclear, the hydro hydrogen bomb. So to me, I think that we basically got to see the 1950s, 60s, 70s, kind of that battle and that ideological battle in America play out in Oppenheimer's head in over a couple year period, which is just pretty interesting to me. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I mean, those ethical questions to me are, are genuine and I think. We can all appreciate them. Um, I mean, think about what the nuclear bomb itself did once it was used. First of all, it changed the world, right? We've never had a weapon that strong that could kill, you know, hundreds of thousands of people instantly. Um, the second, and then the, the radioactive fallout and people dying for months afterwards and all that. And that raises very ethical questions, right? Because is that ethical to do to anybody? Then we can go peel that off and say, well, at this point, is war ethical? Because if you kill a million people like we did over 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan in terms of civilians, that's the estimated number that Americans that we're responsible of killing it was as, a, as a nation. Um, is that ethical? Is that more ethical than if we just drop nuclear bombs on Afghanistan and Iraq and just took care of it within you know, a week? I'm, I'm not saying that there's a right or wrong. I'm just saying this is to me why we should probably... Um, uh, have more care uh, uh, in terms of humanity before we go into wars. I know that's easy to say, and I know that we have several wars going on right now around the world. Um, and yeah. everybody's passionate on each side. If someone heard me saying this from Ukraine or Russia or from the Gaza Strip or from Israel, they'd probably say, man, you got no idea what you're talking about. That side, they did this to me and we got to go get them and all that. So again, this is about humanity, which is, is, is complex and, and, and it's not always rational. And, and so going back to the Second World War, though, just, just on that ethical front, you know, if, if, if one looks at, you know, the history of the time and the Pacific theater, there was estimates that if we were going to go in and, and finalize Japan and try and beat them in a conventional way, just regular military stuff, we would have needed around one million troops to go on and invade Japan on the land. Well, the intelligence was that Japan would not surrender because of a military, like a strategic defeat. Like you have to actually conquer them, take take, take over the land. Just like we know that they're trained their pilots, kamikaze pilots, to just become their own bombs themselves, just drive the plane into a a, a ship and and, and kill themselves in the process. Like you're saying, the intelligence was telling the American leadership that they were training their civilians to do the same thing so that if we landed troops on their shores, their actual civilians would come and just try and kill us too. So we could have had, you know, out of a million troops, hypothetically, half of them dead, and then we could have had 10 million Japanese dead. So what is more ethical? Drop the bomb in the war and and have less fatalities probably in total, or don't use a nuclear weapon and then spend a few more years trying to kill Japan and maybe you have another 10 million deaths. I don't know the answer, but this is why, again, (laughs) humanity is complex. And again, we should probably... um, uh, do a better job of thinking before we get into these kind of conflicts. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. why I'm a fan of things like NATO, because these strategic alliances around the world help us from having these huge war wars uh, on a perpetual basis. Well, it creates a, a higher deterrence because like, for example, like the Ukraine thing is an example of that. Like 
that Ukraine wasn't a member of NATO made them susceptible to getting invaded because if you invade one NATO country, then all the NATO countries are supposed to jump in. And that raises the stakes and make, creates quite a deterrent to invade a NATO country. So you got all these yeah. countries in one block. So now if one gets invaded, it creates a bigger war than otherwise would have been there. But the point being is that that will that acts just to say, OK, well, yeah, you, know, yeah. you don't want that that, that kind of heat, basically. So but similar other, to nuclear bombs, a deterrent. It, it, it does. It, it, it operates irony. similar to yeah. nuclear bombs in that sense. As I mean, and that's I mean, honestly, if you look at the history of the world, the 20th, the, the second half of the 20th century, was pretty good in terms of deterring large scale military, yeah. you know, and, and so you can look at, you know, large alliances and you can look at uh, the, the stakes being raised in terms of nuclear powers as a part of both of those, as a part of that, you know, both being a part of that. So, but I want to, I want to look at this from a little bit more of a philosophical way because it struck me, you know, I said there were two things. One was guilt, but the other was naivete that I think yeah. uh, gripped a lot of the scientists, Oppenheimer included, um, that we could just stop the development of technology once you start down the road. And it's like, can you unring the bell? Once you start down a path of a new and uh, of a new and exciting tech that's also potentially dangerous, can you stop that unilaterally? Can you say, okay, we're going to stop this. And so therefore we're going to control this, the, the development of this technology. And I don't know that you can. I mean, I look at even on a modern times, we have people kind of doing the same kind of thought process and approach with AI. And they're like, oh, we got to, we got to stop. And it's like, I don't know that that's possible because you may stop, but that doesn't, you, how are you going to stop everybody else from stopping? You know, like, and so we, we, we talked about this a couple of years ago when we were talking about the, 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 um, the testing that was being done with viruses and stuff like that. Like, People, once you go start going down these roads, once it's really not even once you start going down these roads, it's like once somebody has the idea to go down the road, I don't know that you're going to be able to stop the development of stuff like this. Now, you may be able to put controls on the deployment of it, which we've seen with arms treaties and so forth, arms treaties that, you know, chemical weapons and stuff. We've been able to we as as, as societies around the world, I mean, I'm going to kind of take those out of rotation in large part. But. We weren't able to just stop them from developing, stop people from developing this stuff. It was more like, okay, well, yeah, you know how to do it. Let's, you know, like, I won't do it if you don't do it type of thing. But I don't know. I, I just wonder what, what was that even what they were asking for in terms of, okay, yeah, let, let's, let's tell everybody, let's say, for example, let's, let's share what this technology is and everybody agree not to, not to develop it further when there was clear steps that could be taken within short order to get there. I don't even know if that's possible. And so like, I, and I asked a philosophical question, like, is that something that is even, is, is that an evidence of, of someone being naive or idealistic? Or do you think it, in that scenario, for example, in the late forties, early fifties, it would have even been possible to put the brakes on the further development of technology like this? Um, that's a lot. But yeah, I mean, like, look at it from AI. Do we think it's even? No, no, but, but let me, let me go there. So, right now. Well, no, I mean, there, like you pointed out some good similarities. And um, and I think it's it's the last part you said is important, which is back then, the 40s and 50s compared to now. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there's first of all, as as time has progressed, that's why I think it was important. That last part you said technology has become smaller, you know, we can do more in, with much smaller, um, you know, microchips, processors and all that. And, and one person can do a lot more with technology at their hands today than they could have back in the 40s and 50s. So, yeah, they had to build a whole town to, to build the first nuclear body. Like they, they built, they literally went and built a whole town in New Mexico. To, to, you don't have to do that now to develop the kind of technology cutting edge. Now. Correct. And that's what I'm getting at is had someone put the brakes on all that back then, like let's say in the middle of them hammering the, the, the nails in the wood to build that town in Los Alamos, if President Roosevelt at the time just said, you know what, we're putting a kibosh on this, I'm, I'm done. And for some reason, let's say the Russians couldn't steal our secrets because we stopped it. Maybe it would have taken another decade or two for physicists to figure this out. I think at some point, you know, we would have had nuclear technology and a nuclear bomb. Now, though, and, and think about it. I'm uh, just in case um, there was any question, I got to announce here that I'm not an astrophysicist or a quantum physicist, just in case anybody <laughs> was wondering. So the, the idea of one of us or a couple of us getting together in a room and creating, you know, going to mine uranium out of the ground and figure yeah, out how to do all that, yeah. enrich it, you know, just all that stuff, right? That's, that's difficult for the average person. But today, 
we have access, all of us, to artificial intelligence that can actually write code and help us maybe create a virus or some kind of worm or a malware or something like that. And someone like me, who's a layman at all this stuff, if I really took my time and energy, I could probably learn how to be effective and disruptive in that way. So I do think that even though we have the similar risks, the, the way that technology has continued to progress, um, it is allowing more of us in our society to have access to tools that can be disruptive. Let me just put it that way. Um, if one looks at the nuclear bomb as an example of a disruptive tool in human history. Um, and then- so That's an interesting point yeah. because what you're saying basically is that, and I would agree with this, like they wouldn't have been able to stop the technology from going in that direction. Like it was going to happen. Like, but if, if they would have, for example, like they wouldn't, Roosevelt wouldn't have put the stop on it because they were concerned at the time that Germany was doing it. So it was going to happen. But let's say after Germany surrendered, if they said, okay, we're not going to put, do, take the last steps to do this. They may have delayed it, you know, is really what is, is they would have yeah. made it been five or 10 more years, but it would have happened because, you know, there's physicists all over the world and there They're are, there are countries. Yeah. yeah. They would have put some resources into it. it may just may not, the, the real the most amazing thing probably about the Manhattan Project is how quickly it all happened, you know, and then and they had labs working in different parts of the world. They, these people over here are rich, enriching uranium. These people over here are rich, enriching plutonium. Like they got all this stuff going on. And so that's probably the most amazing part is, you know, in the similar way to the Apollo program is how, how the, the most amazing part probably is the level of focus and pooling of resources to make something happen quickly. So they could, probably could have delayed it. Um, but I, I agree with you in the sense that right now, when you're looking at the challenges and, and the developments, once we go on along these paths of uh, innovative and new and, and potentially dangerous technologies, because of the decentralized nature of the way things are developed right now and the, the, the less resource intensive way that things are, can be developed, you lessen the ability to even delay. If, if you know, open AI or somebody gets up and says, hey, we're going to put the, put the brakes on this. This is getting too dangerous. That's not going to really <laughs> slow down yeah. much because, you know, the, the scientists even that are working there could be like, all right, well, I'm just going to leave here and go somewhere else who, you know, may not be as fun well funded, but they're close enough. And, you know, like they got computers over there, too, so to speak. Uh, so that's interesting in the sense that it may be we're in a situ we're going into situations now where even that kind of, you know, mindset won't even make much of a difference, whereas before it wouldn't have made it a a fundamental difference but it could have held things back a little bit but yeah. well, i don't even know if that's worth it though at that point you know like you're yeah, the person who has well let me say the person who has the misgivings is probably the person who you would rather have develop on the front on the cutting edge you know like i don't know that you want the guys on the cutting edge that are like yeah boy we're about to do this and you know, <laughs> those guys might deploy it in a way that is a little bit more reckless you know yeah. so i don't know but i think it's a, it's an interesting thought you know like to kind of look at like that yeah, the, the nuclear ex, uh, experiments are very interesting to me because you have everything we've talked about with the, with the negative side, right, which is very negative, the destruction, the killing of people, all that. But if you look, there's some positive that comes out of it, too. I mean, I, I know that I'm going to be very, um, this is going to be a sensitive discussion, but uh, nuclear is considered a clean energy, even though it has radioactive waste. I know that comes out of it. And the idea is that, you know, there's aircraft carriers and submarines right now that are running on nuclear power, and they literally can go for 50 or 60 years without ever needing to refuel. And so there is a benefit to nuclear fission um, and, 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 and the ability for us to harness energy that can kind of is recurring now. A further deal development of technology, basically. Now, yeah. you know, that, that's right. I mean, and I'm not one, I'm not a fan of nuclear fission because of the waste issue, but at minimum... The, the nuclear fission would pave the way for us to get to nu nuclear fusion technology, which, you know, could potentially present the benefits of, of you know, the, the, the fission without the, 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 the radioactive waste that we have nothing to do with. So, I mean, I yeah. think the, 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 the progress of technology, sometimes you got to get through, you know, you got to break the egg, so to speak, in order to get to the omelet, you know. So, I mean, yeah. like, it's again, it's not something that you can say is all or nothing, so to speak. So but I do want to keep us moving. The um, the, the, the other you know, you have the technological, you know, the, the innovation is a big part of the is a big part of the Oppenheimer story. But also so is the the subsequent taking down of Oppenheimer, which involved basically uh, later on. The, the He was outspoken, you know, in terms of 
trying to, 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 to control nuclear arms and to not continue to escalate and so forth and, and stockpile. And eventually people who, who's, from an ideological standpoint, disagreed with him. It appears that they worked to get him out of a pe- position of influence because as the, the father of the atomic bomb, he had he had influence. And so and this involved essentially using his contacts and his you know friends or things that he had done in the past uh, or people he you know more so p- people he had been in contact with in the past to cast doubt on whether he was uh, patriotic enough. And so or whether he was a communist or, you know, to tied to the communists. And this is in the time period in America, like known as McCarthyism or the second red scare where everybody is terrified running around all the time with their hair on fire about communists in our mix that are going to take not take the country down and so forth. So what do you think about the, 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 how communism and the fear of it amongst Americans played such a role in this kind of second part, this other part of the Oppenheimer story where he falls from grace. And essentially what happens is he is, his security clearance is revoked. And, you know, like, and basically he no longer considered trustworthy as, as an American. Yeah. Now, this is a great uh, uh, part of the kind of arc of his story, uh, both in the film and the documentary, because it this whole thing about communism and the culture that was developed in the 50s during the Second Red Scare, um, I think it still permeates our discussions today, both culturally and politically. So, um, and it, I want to go back and forth here, so I'm not talking too long, <laughs> because I want to start at, um, no, because it's important for us to start with some things we've talked about in other discussions, which is our whole way of organizing societies is relatively new to humanity since the industrial age. So this this form of capitalism and and, and, and the way we, we, we organize ourselves has had, like you said, we've had to break some eggs to make this omelet that we look at now, which is our, our good economy and, and, and our first world that we live in today. Part of breaking those eggs was the Gilded Age, late 1800s to the early 20th century, which, you know, without getting into that whole conversation, one could say culminated in the Great Depression, the crash of 1929. So yeah, look, I mean, and we did a, like, a we did a show like yeah, this, show like the Gilded Age documentary, not too long ago. Yeah, these are concepts. That's why I want to start there without spending too much time, but just lead up now to say, okay, communism. The idea of that was formed by Karl Marx in the late eighteen hundreds as an alternative to the the excesses of what people saw as industrialism and all that. These Gilded Age people that were so wealthy that there were everyone else in the country was a peasant. Now. Fast forward to the 1920s, the first Red Scare, and then to the, you know, through the, the Depression, the Second World War, and now you're going into the late 40s and the 1950s. You have now the two dominant powers of the world, the United States and the Soviet Union, that have come out of the ashes of World War II. We are the West. We are capitalist, democratic. The Soviet Union is proud communist. So this is where all this stuff begins to really scare Um, the American leadership that we were being infiltrated by Russian spies and by people that wanted to disrupt the United States because they felt that Stalin didn't want to stop at World War II, that he wanted to continue and take over the entire uh, continent of Europe. So that's where this stuff kind of began. So I want to pass it back to you for, um, for what you're seeing in that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that lays a good groundwork for kind of why you had this angst. There was this, there was yeah. a, a concern. There were two superpowers at the time and there was a, a, a concern that one of the superpowers was trying to undermine the other. And there was, I would say, say the other superpower had shared that same concern that the other was trying to undermine them. And so they're constant jockeying for power. And the interesting thing about it, you know, and then the cold war is it's called that because the, the United States and Russia and the Soviet Union weren't in a hot war against each other, you know, but it was more of an ideological struggle and it played out in proxy battles around the world, but it was. So if it's a battle of ideas, then yes, you can infiltrate a, another country and, and start spreading your ideas and try to, 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 to weaken them, so to speak, that their, your ideology is better than theirs. And in a open society, well, a society that calls itself an open society like the United States, that may be easier than in a uh, an authoritarian society, which the Soviet Union became, you know, with, with Stalin and so forth. So, you know, it, it, it there, there was, I would say, a legitimate understanding that that's something that we could be at risk at is manipulation and so forth through uh, channels 
you know, whether it be political or otherwise media information, like we could be manipulated because we have a, a quote unquote open society. What to me was very interesting about it is that when Oppenheimer was attacked, he wasn't attacked for it. Well, he was attacked because of the things he was saying at the current time, but the, 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 the avenues to attack him were about who he was or what he thought or people he interacted with primarily when he was a younger man. And, and when he was a younger man, you know, this was a time time period not too long after the great after the great financial uh, crash that led us into the Great Depression. And so and we're in this Great Depression. And I think open minded people in that time and young people in that time could look around reasonably and say, well, hold on. Is capitalism really the way that, that things are going to that, that, that creates a, a legitimate, just and workable society? You know, because personally, I look at it and say, like, the, the New Deal is what really was the proof of concept that capitalism doesn't have to be so exploitative constantly. Like, the capitalism can create a society where where it can work for a large number of people in the society or where the economics can work for a large number of people in society. So this was pre the New Deal proof of concept that you can build the biggest middle class in the history of the world using a capitalist framework. So. Yeah, like there there were a lot of questions being asked, you know, amongst people who weren't necessarily agents of the Soviet Union. But I think that was exploited by agents of the Soviet Union. And so it created this situation where and this is something that Oppenheimer talked about or even his wife. If you talked about it's like, yeah, we didn't know in the 30s that all of these communist parties were infiltrated and, you know, operated basically by the the Soviet Union, by Russia. And so that to me was very fascinating in that. You know, like they didn't know. And it reminded me almost of kind of what we saw with social media in the past, you know, 10 years or whatever, where a lot of the, the, the we know that like Russia was using, you know, the, the the social media to put messages out there and to 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 kind of manipulate Americans to think certain things or, and, and or to do certain the, things. Um, the spies that were in the NRA, remember? Maria oh, yes, Butina, yeah, Maria Butina. Butina. Yeah, yeah. Everyone can and, look them up. Anna Chapman yeah. and Maria Butina. Exactly. So, good old and Russian so, spies over the last decade. <laughs> and so, yeah, taking, you know, like people, things that Americans were legitimately concerned about or places that Americans get their information and kind of influencing them in a certain way. So to me, that's what it reminded me of. So it was to, to kind of to, to, to keep moving. My point being is that at the time when Oppenheimer, and again, he, the, the story is that he never joined the Communist Party, but he had friends that were part of it and, and interacted in circles that were, you know, like close to it. And but again, from his standpoint, it was one of compassion. But the it was at the time at that time questioning from an open minded standpoint, OK, well, hold on. You know what? What is a better system or what? How can we make the system work better? Seemed to be not it. That didn't seem to be an act of treason at that time, basically. But that was seen as an act of treason 20 years later in the 50s, because at that point there was zero tolerance tolerance for communism. And in fact, we knew that those at the, in the 30s, the Soviet Union was using those organizations for for for, for manipulation and so forth. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a great point, James, because I think it, it's something we've seen, you know, since then, um, I'm not going to say all human history because I don't have a lens that goes that far back. But <laughs> I can I can talk about the last few decades. Um, no, but but my point is saying that there's there's a little bit of truth in all of it. I think that's the thing that is that is sometimes even hard to to really acknowledge for our brains because we want to have an absolute answer. Mm-hmm. So you're right. Is it true that there were genuine people who were genuinely concerned about you know just the the, the case for the American worker? and that people needed a fair shake and all that, yeah. Is it true that the Russians uh, as a nation, as an adversary of America, were infiltrating communist organizations here in the United States to try and influence and cause disruption here? Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. So there's all, and is it true that there's probably some Americans that were aligned with the Russians and were going against their country? Yeah. And is it true there are probably a lot of Americans that were in these groups and had no idea that that little stuff was going on? That's probably true too. And that's why I make the point of, of the of the influ- the recent Russian influence campaign of the last decade or so that has been well documented, and I'm not even going to get into what some may consider a more controversial conversation about the 2016 election. So forget that. I'm going to say this stuff. That's why I say Marina Maria Butina Anna Chapman. They're well documented. They were Russian spies that were caught, and it was a very well known story in the probably around 2015 2016 that we did a spy swap with Russia. So Russia acknowledged they were spies too by doing a yeah, spy swap yeah. with us, and so and so and the idea was that Maria Butina really infiltrated the NRA and certain 
American conservative political circles. Now, does that mean that all the Americans that were part of those groups knew that she was a Russian spy on the left? No, of course not. Did some maybe yeah, know? Like, yeah. Maybe some knew. Um, but that's the game of espionage, and I'm pretty sure we've done that in Russia, you know, as Americans with American spies. So to me, that's all interesting, right? And that's all stuff that really happened. But, but the, the what, but if, we, if the, the, the similarity would be is if now or if in 10 years we look back and said, OK, anybody who was in the NRA at the time Maria Butina had infiltrated it is we're going to go after them for treason. And it's like, yeah. well, a lot of those people might not have known that Maria Butina right. was a Russian spy who had infiltrated the NRA. And so that that that's how that red scare thing played out in some cases yeah. in other cases yeah there might have been people that you know were legitimately you know on board with the russia thing but uh, it seems like it was a, a situation that was ripe to to kind of entrap a lot of people who thought they were they were just trying to help people out but because the, of what the russians actually had done and because it, you know like the the setup they were like oh wow you actually didn't, you might not have known it, but you were a part of this group or you were sending money somewhere that was a front that the Russia had set up. And you thought you were just being nice to some workers, yeah. so to speak. No, and we saw that. You know what? This is why history is important right? to learn, because we've already seen this in our lifetimes in the last 20 years. I'm thinking about the war on terror. Remember, yeah. after 9-11, that first few years, I mean, we were on edge as a nation. And remember, I remember on the news, there were there was these stories of people getting um, you know, investigated by the feds or even arrested because they sent money to some nonprofit that they thought was just some Middle Eastern nonprofit to help kids over there. And all of a sudden, you know, our intelligence services found that that nonprofit, maybe some money was funneled to some terrorism. Yeah. Right. And, you know, I'm sure maybe some people knew that that's what was going on, but I'm sure a lot of people donating money there did. It. And, and that's just unfortunate. Right. That, that's that why, that's why it's set up as a front. So, but one of the things I wanted to get, so I went and did a little bit of background on the Red Scare stuff back then. Just I wanted a little more foundation for this conversation. And I learned that in 1947, President Harry Truman signed an executive order to screen federal employees for possible association with organizations deemed totalitarian, fascist, communist, or subversive. And that reminded me of Again, there's some people freaking out about the Heritage Foundation has written something, what they call the Project 2025. And that is that, you know, in their mind, if there is a Republican that wins the presidential election this year, that they will, their plan is to go and screen up to 50,000 federal employees for like a loyalty test to see where their loyalties lie and all that. And a lot of people I've seen have taken that as, oh my God, this, you can't do this, this is America. And it was... I'm not going to say it was nice to read that Harry Truman did this, but it was a reminder that a lot of things that we freak out on in today's world, there's precedence already for it, just in general. And this is one where the fear of communism, you know, again, maybe it was a genuine fear, but again, it was used to then suppress like regular dissent and used to, yeah. to attack what was seen as at the time kind of aggressive parts of the culture. So this is why one reason why Hollywood and certain, what I would say, I'm not going to say left wing for this, I'm going to say more liberal and maybe progressive um, institutions like traditionally get attacked is because they're generally the, the ones that usually, like the arts usually open up to others, right? And others who might be on the fringe of society at the time. So what was Hollywood doing back, back in the 40s and 50s was allowing African Americans to act in movies. Right. And, and do certain things. And the music industry was bringing up people like Chuck Berry and, and Ray Charles and Little Richard. And at the time, the African-American community was on the fringe of American culture. And that was seen to be an attack on the established the order way of if, life. Correct. If you're bringing in these outsiders to come in and, 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 and now congregate with the rest of us. Yeah. And so you fast forward to today. That conversation is being had about maybe the LGBTQ community. Maybe maybe it's about immigrants coming from the southern border. Whoever the fringe is in our society today, people who maybe are being sympathetic to those groups and their causes, we hear today they're being called communists, yeah. right? And they're being well, called leftists and all this stuff that's a throwback. Which to mirrors all of that, you know. And I think so, I mean, it's the, fascinating. The key, point, the key point to bring this back in is that a lot of times. These while people may not recognize it, and some do though. Some use it opportunistically, and that's what we saw with with Straw's um, 
it, 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 who is kind of the the, yeah, the big bad crossed. um in in the Oppenheimer story and in both the movie and in the documentary is that these type of scares can be used to settle scores or in, more specifically using your exact language to to go after and suppress regular dissent somebody who just doesn't agree with you then it's like okay well that person then if, if you don't agree with me you're anti-American. And so I'm going to go after you using these other, I'm going to be opportunistic about these other, where society is already kind of sensitive. I'm going to use those things to go after you because I just don't like what you're saying. And so that's what we see there. And that's, I mean, that's to, to, to kind of touch on something else. That's what the concern about the Heritage Foundation thing is like, well, hold on. Are you saying yeah. people are, 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 you know, are actually allied with other nations? Or are you saying they don't agree with you and so, in terms of how to run this nation? And so therefore you're going to go after them for that. And so I think then that's that's what we can see is what ends up happening in a lot of these. And this is why we have something like the freedom of speech and, and or freedom of speech in the First Amendment. Freedom of speech is not about giving people freedom from repercussion on popular speech. <laughs> you don't need freedom for, for yeah. to, to, to say things that are popular. It's to actually have freedom to say things that are unpopular or to criticize people in power. And so it's used with it, these types of situations are where you can see scares and public panic be used to undermine that. And that's what happened in many tellings of it to Oppenheimer is that Oppenheimer was not given the line that many who were in power ideologically wanted to hear, which was we need to keep building nuclear uh, weapons. We need to stockpile. We need to to outbuild Russia in terms of nuclear weapons. And Oppenheimer was saying, hey, we we don't need to keep we don't need to keep building. And so because he took that position, because he disagreed with kind of this ideological point of view, then it was decided we're going to go after this guy. We're going to silence him. Because we want it, we want our ideology to prevail. It had nothing necessarily to do with sufficiently loyal as an American, you know. So yeah. that's a big part of his story, and something that is a warning to us, you know. Like because when we're in these frenzies and afraid of everything like that, it's easy to lose some of the values that and and to to fall victim to 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 people who promise us safety and so forth if we just give up some of our values. So I do yeah. want to wrap this up. Um, just. Last thing, you know, is there anything else that stands out to you in the, in the Oppenheimer story? Uh, you know, like, in, yeah, take that no, it's, um, it's interesting. So I realized we've had this whole conversation um, without talking about kind of part of his, a big part of his personal life, which is his wife. Um, the fact he's a father, the fact that he had um, the- All very the, novel things, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> no, what I'm saying is, I'm saying this with a smile as a joke. Because again, he's a human being, right? When I think of a quantum physicist, like we said at the beginning, I'm thinking of a guy that's all square and you know, <laughs> he's not there trying to bang chicks, you know, and all this stuff. And here's a guy that in the film they said it, he was he had an affair. You know, I think he had a couple affairs um, when he went back to see his old girlfriend at the apartment. I mean, we don't know what happened, but we can assume he spent the night. You know, they weren't just having tea and crumpets. Um, so it's interesting. Like it, he reminds me in a certain way his personality, and and don't. Not a total way, but just a little bit, like an Elon Musk figure, right? Of a guy that's brilliant in a certain way and and created something very unique, you know, whether Tesla or SpaceX, or in this case, he was doing a nuclear bomb. And there's a certain arrogance, naivete about the bigger, you know, political and cultural world out there, because maybe in an earlier part of of his life, he wasn't really exposed to to, to this kind of discourse and and cultural uh, nuances. And then, well, but and then you, just like you it, go down that, but just real quick, I, yeah. I, I'll get you back. But <laughs> the, the, you, you bring up, you know, kind of these human things, but also you it, like that was quite a contrast to what was described as his early life. Remember, they, they talk about in the documentary how they that it's believed that during his whole time at, at, in undergrad, he never had a date. Yeah, you know? but that's why I so, compare him to Elon Musk, because there's been, you know, just chatter about Elon Musk was also one of those kind of kids. They're very smart, but kind of like stayed in the room and tinkered on computers, right? He wasn't really out there, you know, going to house parties. And, and that's what I mean, like like being all out there in his early 20s like that. He was focused on PayPal at the time when he was building that. So, and then that's what I mean, like, and and, and just like Jay, I mean, sorry, um, Oppenheimer didn't really understand the greater um, cultural game, the politics of the era, the whole thing about communism. And I feel like when we see Elon Musk with his tweets, you know, one minute he's tweeting, you know, supporting an anti-Semitic tweet. And then a week later, I see him meeting with the president of Israel. So it's kind of like he's the same way, like he doesn't kind of get it. And then I'm laughing at what makes me think the comparison. And Elon Musk has 12 kids. 
So he's, you know, he's kind of that, that nerdy brainiac guy that still likes the ladies. So that, that was just a fun little thing I noticed about the guy. And then the other thing, just to wrap it up here, is um, I found it fascinating that um, he really, they didn't talk about this that much in the film. They did allude to it in the, um, in the documentary a little more. But his, his love of mysticism, um, the fact that he, he, he learned how to read Sanskrit and became fluent in Sanskrit and became a big fan of the Bhagavad, sorry, Bhagavad Gita, um, the H- Hindu religious text. That was a whole thing I just found interesting. That yeah. Just a wow, yeah, okay. yeah. And and he was really serious about that, that, the fact that he went and actually learned the language and learned yeah. how to read no, in the language. Yeah. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. Um, for me, you know, and this is actually something that uh, you had mentioned and we, we kicked around offline. One of the interesting things was that, you know, he was, Oppenheimer was the son of an immigrant. And, yeah. you know, like, so... You look at that and, and you just look at the American history, look at American history and just how often we read or see that, that you have these transformative figures who aren't five, six uh, generations American. Like they're, they're immigrants who came here. His father came here penniless and couldn't speak the language. And you think about and we're about 2024. We're about to get into the, every election year. You know, there's always a lot, a lot, a lot of talking about immigration and there's caravans and all this other stuff. And we got all these people who are trying to come here penniless that don't speak the language. And I'm looking like, man, you know, like that's Oppenheimer's dad, you know, in a sense, yeah. you know. And so he comes here and he, he works his butt off and, you know, becomes a successful person, marries an American and has a kid. And then that kid is you know, a brilliant, one of the brilliant men of the 20th century and, and led the team that developed the first atomic bomb. And again, I always look at that and maybe this is my own ideology or my own kind of just, but it looks just, it looks like I'm my view of what's happening. What happens here is that it seems like immigration consistently gives America such a leg up in terms of just as a nation, you know, it, it doesn't allow the nation to stagnate. Now, Americans, Native Americans have always been hostile to immigrants, but it seems like the the, the constant. Hold on, be of, very clear what you say. Uh, do you mean Native Americans that we otherwise call Indians? <laughs> or are you talking about Native white Americans? Na- native have yeah, come native from Europe white before a certain period. Okay. Yeah, the Native white <laughs> that Americans. That's a very important distinction. For, well, no, it's, it's it's you're right. No, it's it's a, and it actually shows the ridiculousness of it. Yeah. Because what I mean by that is Native white Americans who have been here for a generation or two. Yeah. And they're like, oh, the immigrants. You know, they, we can't let those immigrants in. And so, to be fair, I'll, I'll call the Native white Americans those who can trace their ancestry to this country prior to the Civil War. That that'll be my cutoff line. Well, but it's not just them though. When you get to the 1900 or the you know, 1900s, 20th century, there were people who were I know, I know. a year early on to win that There's were like, oh yeah, two generations in whose, whose grandparent came in 1950 that'll say they're native. American. No, in <laughs> the same way now that we see, you know, the Hispanic community sometimes, we'll see some of them saying, no, no, you don't let any more immigrants in from the Southern border. And it's like, you know, like, so I, I just think we should be very careful. Now, obviously we need to have, <laughs> th- th- we need to secure the border. We can't just have an open border where people just can't just, just have roll it in. all open and everyone run across yeah, the field. Yeah, you got to have some type. Okay. Well, no, you have to have to do it in some orderly way. There's no, there's a reason why there was an Ellis Island set up at, at a various point, at a different point in American history, because it's like, all right, we got to, pro- we got to know who these people are. We got to, you know, like there has to be some system in place. It can't just be a free for all. But at the same time, it's a, it's a pretty big advantage as far as nation building to have a constant influx of highly motivated people who get up and leave everything that they know and come just for the chance to work, to have highly motivated people that just keep wanting to come. That's a, that know, seems like a pretty big is, advantage. The downside is it's scary. And, <laughs> well, it's scary and, from a xenophobic way. Tucker, Tucker, Cole, Tucker Carlson told me that it's going to dirty America. So that yeah. that's scary to me. So, and there were, now, but, there were but, the Tucker Carlson's of 1900 that said no, that's that. that's what I was going to say. It's, it's a great point because if you look at the period, his, his dad immigrated in 1888. Um, and again, the audience, this is fun stuff. Go look up the history of um, 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 discrimination against German immigrants in the United States in the late 1800s. Yeah. So th- this is, again, how it's just interesting that there was more concern of European immigrants coming here and dirtying the blood of native white Americans at the time than there was of even the southern border or concerns about African Americans, like like there's a period in American history where Eastern Europeans. I know Germany is not necessarily that east, but but is more central. But but were considered like the biggest risk to soiling the American culture. So it's just we've gone through these waves of of this kind of xenophobia and these mindsets. And 
uh, what I find but yet interesting. We continually benefit from that, yeah. that there is a constant stream of immigration coming in. Like well, that's the duality, the irony of it, that, yeah. that we benefit from it. But at the same time, um, there's always this faction that is scared of it. And yeah. so it's just tension at all times. And But, but some and, of that, I know. think, and I mean, and let, I want to wrap, but some of that, I think, is, and we just have to, to I think, learn to, 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 to kind of just deal with this and account for it in our society. There are just some people in any society that are just more uh, susceptible to fear-based messages. You know, right. like they're just susceptible to like you can, they're easy to scare. Oh, it's all this. Oh, it's all that. We got to watch out for this. We got to watch out for that. And they get into a frenzy. And so that's just always going to be there. And so like it, it, one, we have to keep, be mindful of ourselves. If you're not one of these people, be mindful of yourself and saying, Hey, am I just falling into a fear-based message? But it seems like a lot of the things that people are told to be afraid of are things that America has and can draw strength from. You know, a lot of countries yeah. have the problem of they don't have enough young people. They don't have enough people that are motivated to do stuff. And we get young, motivated people constantly co- trying to come here and, and work. You know, like that seems like that's something you could use to your advantage. The other thing I'll mention just real quick before we get out is yeah. this is another danger I see here is that when I look at projects like the Manhattan Project and the Apollo program, I'm looking at things. These are things that were enabled by government. And so I'm just I, I'm, I'm more skeptical every time I see stuff like this of the people who come into government saying the government is the problem. And I don't want like I, I'm fine with that thought and people holding government accountable. But I don't necessarily know if we want the people in the government to think that the government doesn't have a use, you know, because government has clearly the United States government has clearly been at the forefront of some pretty substantial and major developments over the 20th century and before and after. And I, th- I don't know that we want to have people in the government who are saying the government sucks, but we do want to hold the government accountable. So, I mean, I'm not saying that, that there's no role for that, you know, like, but just just be very careful of your people. If your people are leading the government, say that the government has no role because we see the government can play a very big role in advancement of, of the United well, States. It and, depends and what your priority is. If your priority is governing and moving a country forward, then you're right. If your priority is fundraising and being on cable news, then these people are very effective. So, so you are honestly not moving the country forward. If you don't want to keep things moving forward, if you want to be regressive, then yeah, I mean, so I got, I got one last fun thing before we part. Um, okay. Because I, I was thinking, Real as quick. I was joking about Elon Musk on a serious note, you know what I thought? And this is again my uh, distaste for social media. Thinking about how complex this guy Oppenheimer was and what he really thought. Think about if he had Twitter and Instagram and all that back then when he was in his twenties and thirties. Oh, yeah. How Imagine crazy, all the tweets. How crazy he would look yeah. talking all that with all his. So that's my point is saying that it's just interesting that we're in this world where we, 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 we're able to see what's going on in real time because they, people keep telling us. They keep just putting themselves out there. And I'm kind of glad that a lot of these historical figures didn't have access to. Well, to your media. point, he <laughs> was dragged through the mud for kind of associations and thoughts that he might have expressed in his 20s and 30s. And that was just based on, you know, how they were able to put piece it together. If it was now, he, they'd have a whole record of everything he was thinking and who he was with well, based like, on social too, media. Now we got a lot, record of a lot of people and they seem to escape scrutiny. <laughs> well, say maybe crazy stuff. is less, but <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I think we can wrap from there, man. That's a yeah. good point, though. Um, but we do appreciate everybody for joining us on this episode of Yes, Call and Life. hold on. For those that are watching our video, this is the only time I can be proud of a shirt about Adams. So that hey, work good, good. in honor of Oppenheimer and the so, breaking of the Adam. Subscribe to the podcast, rate it, review us, tell us what you think, send it to a friend. Till next time, I'm James Keys. I'm Tunde Romano. All right, we'll talk to you next time.